Welcome viewers to our ongoing program, Focus, coming to you from Burlington, Vermont, remotely from the studios of Channel 17 Town Meeting TV Center for Media and Democracy. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and it gives me great pleasure, viewers, to welcome our guest, William L. McCone, the author of Vermont's Irish Rebel, Captain John Lonergan, and that's the title of our program, Vermont's Irish Rebel, Captain John Lonergan. And welcome, I'm going to call you Liam, the Irish for William. Welcome, Liam. Thank you so much for inviting us into your home and to do this wonderful talk. Well, Jay, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And it's it's a, uh, you, you wrote a, such a marvelous book that was published several years ago now in 2010, but I'm a, a, a devoted reader of it. There's so much in it that tells the story of Captain John Lonergan, who was forced to leave his home, his, his birthplace in County Tipperary, Ireland, and uh, during the famine, right, or right around the time of the famine, and come to, uh, he eventually made his way as a child to Burlington, Vermont, and he was a hero of Gettysburg in the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, and received the Medal of Honor from the United States. And all the time he was devoted to the Fenian movement, the liberation of Ireland. So Liam, you, you told such a wonderful tale in your book, uh, a st the story, his story. So could you share it, something of it with our viewers now as we come up to St. Patrick's Day, again, the, the patron saint of Ireland. I'll be happy to. Thank you for your kind words at the introduction. Um, Lonergan was responsible for the first St. Patrick's Day ever held in Burlington. Uh, that was one of the things that he did to promote the cause and to, to help the Irish be more accepted into Vermont society. They initially weren't that welcome. Uh, without going too far back into the Irish history, although it's fascinating, uh, no matter how deeply and how far back you go, um, just to, by way of background, uh, the Irish lost their independence to the, to the British monarchy um, and they lost their land to the British landlords and things were very difficult, particularly for the Catholic population. So when a series of blights affected the main source of food for the, for the average Irish population, um, the, the potato famine, so-called, um, that had a, a lasting impact on, on the population and the history. And as you referenced, John Lonergan came over with his family about the time of what we think of as the famine, although it was really a series of crop failures. Um, we had that same blight hit the gardens here in Vermont about three years ago that took out my tomatoes and a lot of other people's, I think. Um, so it's still around. These pandemics don't uh, tend not to go away. <laughs> they just get <laughs> under control. So at the time, uh, Ireland had about 8 million people. Uh, after 10 years of, of distress, which kind of culminated in 1847, referred to as Black 47, that was the worst of it. Um, 2 million out of the 8 million had disappeared. About a million died and a million left the country. Um, there was an uprising that was sparked in part by this dreadful conditions that were where food was being exported by the landlords while the tenants were starving in 1848. Um, unsuccessful, but uh, had a lasting impact. Uh, it was organized in part by a man named John O'Mahony, uh, who lived about two miles down the road from John Lonergan. Um, just outside of Carrick on Shore, County Tipperary. O'Mahony was one of the more successful rebels in the 1848 
uh, attempt to overthrow the, the British rule, uh, fled to France with a man named James Stevens, got involved in the revolutions over there. And then when O'Mahony came to New York City about 10 years later, he founded a revolutionary group in New York City called the Fenian Brotherhood. Now, O'Mahony was, was an Irish speaker. He had the Irish, as, as we say. Um, and he translated a, a very seminal history of Ireland from the Gaelic into English. Uh, I'm a translator myself, so I have a, an appreciation for, for what, he, what he did there. So when he founded this revolutionary group, he reached back to the history of Ireland when warrior bands called Fina were at the call of the High King to protect the country. And the adjectival form for Fina is Fenian. Um, they should have used two E's because some people say Fenian, but it's Fenian. Um, so he reached back for, the, for this reference to protecting Ireland from the foreign invaders uh, and formed the Fenian Brotherhood. This was uh, while well, John Lonergan was still just a lad, but he was growing up in Burlington. He worked as a cooper with his father making barrels and they had a shop. Uh, and then in 1860, the, the situation in the United States was getting more and more critical in terms of the South and the North and the issue of slavery. Um, and the militia units, which are official but part-time soldiers, um, had kind of fallen into disrepute and, and weren't doing much, but were revived in the 18th, around 1860 um, because people could see the chance of war coming. Mm -hmm. So Lonergan was, I believe, recruited to raise a unit by George Standard out of St. Albans, who commanded a regiment of Vermont militia. So Lonergan saw this as an opportunity uh, and it fit in with John O'Mahony's strategy because Fenian militia units were being formed throughout the United States. And this gave them a chance to learn the art of war and get paid for it. Not much, but they, uh, the state would, would sponsor these. And throughout the United States, there were companies often with fa fanciful names, um, the emerald rifles and things like this that were very indicative of their, and they would populate the, the unit with Fenians, with Irishmen. Mm -hmm. So Lonergan formed his own unit, called it the Emmett Guards after uh, Robert Emmett, who was executed 1801 for yet another unsuccessful rebellion. He, uh, he formed that in Burlington and drew on the, um, the sizable uh, Irish population in Burlington at the time. and was quite successful in creating this official Vermont militia unit. In 1861, when Lincoln was inaugurated on the 4th of March and pled with everybody that we must not be enemies, um, unsuccessfully, six weeks later, we were shooting each other and it went on for four years. Um, Lincoln had to call upon the state militias to provide the manpower to try and suppress this insurrection. Um, some states complied, some refused, others joined the secessionist movement. Uh, so Lonergan's company, the Emmett Guards, was called up for the 2nd Vermont Regiment. Um, and he was commissioned as a captain in command of this company. Um, unfortunately, it was, they mustered in in Burlington. Uh, the muster was on a Saturday uh, and his company didn't show up. Apparently there was people saying farewell on Friday night, yeah. Uh, 
So they, he rounded them up the next day and got them all sworn in. <laughs> but he so angered the governor that the governor disbanded his unit, which didn't happen <laughs> any other time in the, in the Civil War. The guy, <laughs> uh, so Lonergan said, well, you can get rid of my, my unit, but you won't get rid of me. And he attached himself to the 2nd Vermont Regiment, went down and fought in Virginia for a while stormed into the Secretary of War's office to demand restitution <laughs> and actually had an interview with the Secretary of War, was sent back to Vermont to raise another company. Yeah. So just a remarkable brash as would have been 23 years old there, this Irishman. Uh, I'm sure he had, had a terrible brogue coming from Tipperary as a child. <laughs> So he, uh, he came back here under orders to go ahead and raise another company. And uh, 1863, uh, Lincoln wanted to increase the manpower and he raised 300,000 men just to serve for nine months. Um, so Lonigan got on board with this movement. Is, uh, he, he raised enough Irishmen in Burlington and in Rutland and a few non-Irish out of Westford uh, that he uh, he knew these people, so he got them got them to sign up, um, and he, he formed this company. And when they assigned the letter designations for the companies, it's always in seniority. So, right in character, he claimed that he was the oldest captain around because he'd been been captain of, of a company in the Second Vermont, even though the governor had disbanded. <laughs> so he became Company A. Uh, of the 13th Vermont. This all ties in later with uh, with his position on the battlefield at Gettysburg. Right? So in addition to raising troops for the American cause, he was also the head of the Fenian Brotherhood in Vermont. So he was uh, doing double duty. But uh, Margaret, you mentioned uh, a, a statement about the dual loyalty. And I, I did go back in the book and I found that. So let me just. Okay. It was, uh, I had to put my, my spectacles on to read it, but it, it is a good explanation. This was on a, on a St. Patrick's Day. Lonnie was called up on to speak and mm -hmm. concluded his impromptu speech with consideration of the dual loyalty of the Irish in America. On a day like this, we should all be proud. We're all from Ireland and we should regard her with love and pride. He noted that some might ask how an Irishman could love two countries at once, but an Irishman's heart was large and had room for both Ireland and America. When an Irishman takes a wife, as he is sometimes liable to do, does he therefore forget his mother? America is Irishman's wife but he does not forget his mother, Ireland. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you reminded me of that the other day because I think that's, that's a significant comment. Yes, yeah. And it shows, it shows so much of his character of his enormous love for both the land of his adopted land and the land of his, his birthplace. So willing to risk his life for either or both. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he was just the average citizen soldier. He had no training other than his little time in militia there. Um, and yet he became a respected and honored um, combat veteran of the Civil War. Uh, and they, they get, bought him some credit with the Fenians, I think, because a lot of Fenians went to war to learn the art of war, but a lot of them didn't come back. So. Right, right. So should we spend a few minutes on Gettysburg before we... I, I, I would love that. Gettysburg was one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. And of course it was where at the end of it, Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg Address and, but also the carnage, the deaths on both sides were enormous. And uh, so please do spend some time on it. And also, um, about the the ins and outs of it in in your your book is so full of the facts and yet the the character and personality of uh, 
of, of Captain Lonergan comes through by his actions, how he reacted to different things. In fact, there was one that I, did, I just read now again in rereading where he, just before the Battle of Gettysburg, he was addressing his regiment as the captain of the regiment and somebody else was addressing the regiment at the same time. Do you recall that part of the, uh, of the book? I mean, it shows, and, and then he just, he, did, he there was humor in it also, you know, that he just, it was the thing to do and just get on with it. So. Yeah, there had been a change in command. The colonel was away, the major took charge and Lonergan pulled out his weathered old commission that the governor had taken away and said, oh, no, no, I'm senior to you. So they, but in the regiment, he was initially most famous for on the march to, to Gettysburg, he fell off his horse when they were crossing the Monocacy River, which is uh, in Maryland. Uh, and they, they fished him out and he said, ah, too wet on the outside, not enough on the inside. He said, if I didn't. <laughs> If I'd had a good drinking man, I would have fallen off the horse. But, <laughs> and it, it, he had, uh, the officers were mostly mounted as they marched to Gettysburg. They marched 120 miles in July, June, July heat um, in six days to get to Gettysburg in time to fight. Uh, and that was like to, thanks to Standard, his old mentor who had just taken over the brigade. Um, but the, more than one of his, the men in his company remarked on that Lonigan would spend very little time riding his horse, that he usually had somebody else giving him a break. And mm -hmm. sometimes two or three guys hanging on to the, to the stirrups because they were, they were marching so hard. Mm -hmm. So he cared for his men, he respected them. He had recruited a, a, a school teacher down in Rutland, a guy named John Sennett, uh, to be his First Lieutenant, that's Lana was the captain of the Company A, 13th. Senate was the First Lieutenant. And then he got a guy out of the marble quarries in Rutland um, to be the Second Lieutenant. Six foot four marble worker. And if there was ever any discussion that needed to be settled, his Second Lieutenant could, could <laughs> certainly pick him up by the scruff of the neck if necessary. Uh, so it was a mixed bag, you know, that, uh, uh, a lot of characters in, in this, you know, they, the 12 or so members of the company from Westford, once they realized they were caught in the middle of a Fenian Irish unit, tried to get out of it, uh, <laughs> but he, he managed to convince them now that, that they were better off. They only had to serve their, their nine months and they were exempt <laughs> from any, um, any further uh, threat of the draft. And they had a pretty quiet time of it. They were sitting on the Occoquan River um, down in Virginia, but they were the outermost defenses of Washington. Um, and they were kind of isolated and alone out there uh, operating on their own. And it was a quiet area, except not when Lee headed north with his entire army. Uh, and suddenly they were attached to the Army of the Potomac and they were assigned to the Corps that was all the way to the front um, and they had to catch up with them. And they almost got gobbled up by Stuart who brought these over 5,000 cavalrymen right through about an hour after they left. Anyway, they got up to, to Gettysburg in time for the fighting, um, but Standard was pretty much on his own and he picked his spot uh, and he moved the, the Vermonters out in front uh, because of the shelling that was going on. So when Pickett's famous charge took place up Cemetery Hill on Cemetery Ridge on the 3rd of July, the Vermonters ended up in a position where Standard ordered them out to swing out like a barn door and take the rebels in the flank. And Lonergan led the charge because he was company A, he held the the, the position of honor because of that. Um, and he led that whole charge. So how are we doing? Uh, okay, well, well that's a, one, we're doing well on the time. We have, uh, we're, we're about uh, 20 minutes in now. 
but but I thank you for the that description in the Battle of Gettysburg. But also, can you uh, speak to the the next part? He he uh, he raided a house and and they got out a lot of the Confederate army, right? And they they uh, they really arrested uh, double the number of of uh, to them, right? It was the, the Lonergan received the the uh, Medal of Honor, and you correctly said received or awarded. It's not something you win. It ain't, it's not for a contest. He was awarded that for gallantry. Um, actually, for the recapture of some cannon on the night of the of July 20, uh, July 2nd. Um, and after they recovered the cannon, which the rebels had taken over, they had charged down the hill with what they said was a wild Irish cry. Probably Fagabala, which is the, the Irish for clear the way, the old battle mm -hmm. cry. They got the cannon back and then his colonel said, can you do something about those rebels that are shooting at us from the house? He said, I can. And he went over, pounded on the door, demanded that they all come out and was a little bit taken aback when twice as many of them came out as he had men. But by then he'd, he'd captured them and, and marched them back. The famous story was that the, these guys had just arrived, the Vermonters, and these old hands said, what boys are you? And I said, oh, we're the Green Mountain Boys. And I said, oh, we knew you were green because we would never have gone down there. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was a risky business, but he, but he did it. So they, uh, they lost four men from the company, killed, another half dozen wounded. Several of them are buried there at Gettysburg. And I regularly go down to tip my hat to, to them at Gettysburg and of course to Lonergan at his, his grave, which is in St. Joseph's. Yeah, so no. they got back. And, wait a minute, uh, wait, uh, where, where, is Lon where is Captain Lonergan's grave? St. Joseph's, Archibald Street. In Burlington. Okay. Yes, I I can yeah. see the the cemetery from my window. You were here. saying you were here and there. Yes, and if uh, you haven't been there, you should. Um, yes, people should go. I'll, I'll meet you there. Um, yeah. So above the ground, above the ground. Above the ground. We'll meet you above the ground. Listen now. Uh, let's let's go to the uh, to the return. After the uh, the civil after the civil war was over, then and the Fenians were then uh, re-emerging to the purpose of the invasion. Sure. I will throw in a, a quick description of the return of Lonergan and his his men. Most of them he dropped off in Rutland, where they came back, but they came into Burlington and were received as heroes in City Square um, with quite quite a big to do. Uh, there is a historical marker on St. Paul's Street at City Square, City Hall Square, um, describing Lonergan as, and his exploits in, this, in the Civil War. So by the time the Civil War ended in 1865, the surviving Fenians on both sides were ready to get back to the business of freeing Ireland. Um, but as sometimes happens among the Irish, not everybody agreed on how to do things. <laughs> uh, so there, there was quite a discussion about whether they, they all pack their muskets and, and get on a ship and go to Ireland or some people who didn't want to risk that voyage said, we can strike a blow against the British empire. Uh, let's grab Canada and hold it hostage for Ireland. So there was a faction that, that did this. And in 1866, there was quite a significant incursion into Canada, led mostly by a fellow named John O'Neill, former uh, officer in the Union Army, uh, who crossed over from Buffalo, New York, went across the, the Niagara River there. And there was quite a, quite a to-do over there with a couple of dozen men actually killed and, and some international um, concerns about this. Meanwhile, there was another branch that went across from Vermont um, and attacked the Eastern townships of, of Canada. Um, it was more in the nature of a demonstration of um, the Irish cause than any hopes really of 
taking several hundred men and occupying Canada. I think you'd need need a few more than that. Yeah, um, it threw enough of a scare into the British, so that uh, that's how Canada became a country. It was just provinces up to that point. And in 1866, they said, "You guys have to defend yourselves," um, and they made Canada a dominion. That's why Canada Day is the first of July, 1867. The direct result of, of this attack by the Irish. Now, the Irish were being used to some extent by President Johnson, who had succeeded after, to the presidency after Lincoln was assassinated. Um, they were trying to get money out of the British for their support of the Confederacy. Uh, and after this little incursion of them saying, hey, we got several hundred thousand angry, experienced Irish veterans. You want us to, to push them across the border again? Uh, the British, in fact, did pay up um, for the damage they'd done to the to the U.S. shipping, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, there were events taking place back in Ireland, and a lot of Fenians went to Ireland, and there was a series of of um, uprisings. Uh, none of them that successful, um, but the the cause continued. Uh, then, in 1870. Uh, there was another attempt to attack Canada. Uh, this time they decided not to try have to cross the Niagara River. So they, the, uh, the one prong of the attack went from Malone, New York, because you could walk from Malone across the border. Um, and the other, again, was staged in St. Albans. Irishmen came from all over the United States, many of them ex-Confederates. Uh, and came to, to St. Albans, worked their way up to Fairfield where the farmers up there had been storing the weapons that they needed for this attack on Canada. And it was timed to catch the Canadians off guard while they were celebrating Queen Victoria's birthday. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, uh, the cause was riddled with informers uh, and the newspapers were full of the, the Fenian intentions, uh, so it came as no surprise to the to the Canadians. They were uh, anticipating the attack. Um, it was quickly stopped at the border, mainly by a group of uh, citizen soldiers called Home Guards. Now, one guy in particular was upset because the last time the, the Irish had come up there, they'd broken into his house and destroyed his piano. So he's <laughs> supposedly the guy that fired the first shot and it killed a young fireman from Burlington. Mm. Um, mm. There's, a, there's a very moving photo of, of his body there. Um, so there were there was another fellow, and that was John Rowe, and another fellow named William O'Brien from Moriah, New York, were both killed, and a number of people wounded, all on the Irish side. But this was all under the command of John O'Neill again, the fellow that had done a credible job when they went across from Buffalo in 1866. But he had been warned by the U.S. Marshal in Burlington, who was a strapping fellow that was the last commander of the Vermont Brigade in the Civil War. And he took no nonsense. And he warned them and he went over and he told the Canadians what the Irish were up to. And he came back and the Irish went across and he grabbed O'Neill by the scruff of the neck, threw him in his carriage and took him back to Burlington where he mm -hmm. was tried for violation of neutrality and served a term of uh, in the Windsor prison in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of where the Fenians uh, tapered off and it, it, the cause took on other names like Clan Nagale, um, but the Fenians had, had made an impression. Um, there was still, the term is still used derogatorily uh, to describe Irish nationalists uh, by those who disapprove of the nationalism. Um, usually Fenian B with, a, with an expletive afterwards. Um, and it became very much a part of, of the uh, 
the heritage, the historical nature, the identification of the movement for Irish nationalism. And it, it all goes back to John Romani from his farm up in Muller out on St. John's Road, just outside of Carrick on Shore. Um, and John Lonigan playing as a child down there on the on the Glen River and the Glen Napuka, the, the the valley of the the Puka, which is a um, is like a, a witch-like figure, yeah. Right. And it all it all ties together. It's great stories of Finn McCool, who was one of the original leaders of the uh, the Fenians, the Fena, uh, that fought for the High Kings back in the the early early centuries of the current era. So where, what else uh, would we want to? Uh, well, I I don't know. I'm so moved by by your your uh, your encapsulation of of the whole movement now, and I think that it's a wonderful thing that you you have brought this alive to us, even in this short interview. And we want to mention the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership, uh, from whom you have received a grant. To do what, uh, Liam? What to what commemorate the... the 150th anniversary of the 1870 attack? Um, that was, was all supposed to happen last year. I gave the first of a series of lectures on the 9th of March, and then the the ceiling fell in. So we're right. we're approaching it virtually, and I'd want to invite uh, folks to check the Fenian Historical Society org website. In the next few weeks, I'll be offering. Um, webinar series uh, focused on the Fenian history in more detail than, the, than we're able to cover here. Okay, well, we'll be, we'll be there. And also, uh, Liam, we should mention the, um, the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival, which is going on right now. And it's at www.burlingtonirishheritage.org. And it was at one of the, uh, those events in the, in the last few years where I first met you and attended your wonderful uh, talk about the Fenians. So, so Liam, I'm so grateful to you and we all are here at Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy and for your, 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 on, your story, the way you told it, you tell it and uh, you embody all of that, uh, the historical passion that you, you keep on going with your writing and your it's, communication like in, in this. So I, yeah, it just, it's, a, it's a reminder that one man can make a difference. Yes. People that believe in the cause um, and work for it and are willing to sacrifice can can ultimately make a difference. Yes. Because the, the Fenians were a reference when, when, they, when Ireland finally gained at least partial independence in the Easter uprising of, of 1917. There was a man named Patrick Pierce that led the, the group that occupied the general post office in Dublin. And the year before he had spoken at, a, at the burial of Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, an unrepentant Fenian. Uh, and he, Pierce said about the British, he said, the fools, the fools, the fools, they've left us our Fenian dead as long as we have these graves, Ireland unfree will, Ireland unfree will ever be at peace. So very direct lineage from what the Fenians did to the, to the current status of, of Ireland, where it's at least partially independent, a Republic of Ireland, the right. 26 counties. Thank you so much, Liam, for your wonderful talk now, and we'll look forward to hearing more from about about the story, the history, by, from the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership talks that you will give, and and hopefully you'll return to us here on Channel Seventeen. Always welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the for the invitation. Slán, slánche, slánche, gurumalika. <laughs>